Welcome, good evening, and welcome to the Imagine Awesome Speaker Series. I'm Matt Dugan with the City's Planning and Zoning Department. Um, the speaker series tonight is Texas Next uh, with Richard Parker. Uh, the speaker series is one of the ways we try to move the Imagine Awesome plan forward with um, educational um, outreach and engagement um, on interesting topics. And we bring in thought leaders to talk on things such as um, our core principles for action, which are grow as a compact, connected city, integrate nature into the city, provide past prosperity for all, develop as an affordable and healthy community, sustainably manage our water, energy, and other environmental resources, and think creatively and work together. Um, so talking about people, talking about population, that's one of the foundations for um, planning for the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. Back in 2009, when we kicked off the process, city demographer Ryan Robinson did our population projection and said we were gonna add an additional 750,000 people and 300,000 jobs to Austin over the next 30 years. Um, so we're uh, so excited to have Richard here to talk about, about this stuff. Um, I, uh, I found out about Richard with uh, reading some of his articles in the, in the New York Times, and um, in the bottom it said, you know, Richard's uh, an, an author and journalist in Central Texas. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I started digging around. I would email him, I called him. I emailed again, I called him. <clears throat> he emailed back and said, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll talk with you. It sounds, sounds a little bit interesting. So I got Ryan Robinson, we went down to South uh, Austin and met Richard, and uh, uh, on the way down, uh, I was telling uh, Ryan about this, like, you know, hey, we gotta go down there, we gotta impress this guy, we gotta, we gotta sell him to get him to, to uh, do one of these speaker series for us. And so, uh, so Ryan says, oh, that Richard Parker? And it's like, yeah, so he said, uh, how did you get to meet with him? I said, well, I don't know, we're, we're ready to have lunch with him. So he starts getting nervous, and uh, anyways, had a great lunch, a uh, really good conversation at the end, Richard said, sure. Well, you know, like you guys, like what you're trying to do, um, I'd be happy to help you guys out. Um, so with that, here's Richard Parker. Thank you. Thank you. Nice introduction. <clears throat> Thank you. That was the nicest introduction I think I've ever had. Um, looks like we're a small group tonight, which is great. Uh, if you like, this is not grade school. You're welcome to sit closer, and if you're happy where you are, please stay right there. Um, I'm going to talk for hours and hours. No, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes and um, take questions. Since we are a small group, I'm actually going to invite you to interrupt me along the way. Um, I may need to keep boring through a little bit of the text, but I'll just raise your hand and I will... Uh, I'll get to you. Um, let's see, this is the clicker. All right. Okay. Well, first I wanna thank Matt uh, for the introduction, Ryan Robinson, who he mentioned, and uh, Kathleen, who's right there as well, for having me here. Obviously, I wanna thank the city of Austin and you guys for taking time uh, on what is probably a busy evening for you. <clears throat> like any Texan, I love nothing more than to talk about, yes, Texas. And today I'd like to present a distinct view of our history, our present, and what I think is our near future. Um, some of you may find it a little controversial. Some of you have already figured this out, but it's all food for thought, and that's all to the good. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I have been a journalist for over 30 years now. Um, I write a weekly column for the Dallas Morning News. I write for the New York Times, as was mentioned, and a bunch of other Washington-based publications like Politico and The Atlantic. I've written about nearly everything after 30 years, but these days I mostly just write about Texas. Let's see if I can get the clicker. There we go. Um, so, a few years back, I wrote a whole book about Texas, how it was changing and how, among other things, liberalizing. And what this meant, not just for Texas, there we go, but also for the country. Now, at the time, I didn't get that kind of reception. I mostly got questions like, are you crazy? Um, and no, I'm not, because now I think with a little bit of 
the passage of time and some evidence, the trends that I talked about in that book are coming to bear some fruit. Um, but this being, I, I do want to talk more about, about more than just politics, but, but this being an election year, um, I do want to start, as Evan Smith says, with the sizzle before we get to the steak. And that is this. Uh, the bottom line is that the era of the right wing in Texas is ending. Uh, it is ending even as we speak, and it is ending even though they may profess to the contrary. Now, obviously, this is going to have political effects, not just in Texas, but for the nation as well. Texas right now is in the middle of a political realignment that comes along once in a generation, if then. The last such realignment in the 1990s was what turned Texas Republican. It also helped seal, generally, a Republican control of the White House in the ensuing years. Um, but all good things must come to an end, right? And that realignment is now being almost precisely reverse engineered by a new realignment. These factors include not just growth, right, but the density of the population, and not just people moving to Texas, but mass migration on a large scale of Americans from other states and people from other parts of the world. Sweeping demographic change, to which the Republican Party has responded by becoming more socially conservative and more withdrawn from the business of governing to focus on the task of politicking to an ever smaller electoral base. Without giving away the whole story, the Republican Party is actually shrinking in Texas. I'll show you that in a little while. <clears throat> when people talk about politics, they like to talk about tactics. Candidates and consultants and money and what was the percentage difference in this poll or the final outcome. What they tend to overlook, and what I'm trying to focus on here, is more than that. Instead, to focus on fundamental change in society, in our economics, in who we are. <clears throat> the far right of the Republican Party, in general, but in this state certainly, is grossly out of step with the evolution of public attitudes and even corporate values in this country. These are crucial, whether you're a worker or a shareholder or a voter. The failed bathroom bill in Texas was a perfect example, right? Um, the show me your papers laws that are on the books and challenged in the courts is yet another. What has happened is that the far right has decided to risk billions of dollars in economic growth not to mention posed an affront to just general human decency. So maybe Amazon will move to Texas, but you will knock me over with a feather when that day comes. The latest guess, if you believe guesses, is that Amazon is closer to moving to Washington, D.C., Virginia, or Maryland. I think probably the most troublesome thing <clears throat> about the political environment in which we have found ourselves is this economic effect. People can have pretty sharp elbow differences about various policies, immigration, gun control, uh, you name it, that's fine. Where everybody tends to agree, particularly in Texas, is on the importance of jobs. On that, there is really no partisanship. Um, and because of that, we've never seen before at a national level, let, level, let alone in Texas, this kind of daylight between big business and the ruling party, for lack of a better word. But business is not buying what the right wing is selling. 
The net effect of all this dizzying change, population growth, economic boom, diversification, dense urbanization, is all coming home to roost. In political terms, it looks like this. In less than 10 years, according to data from Gallup, Texans have become far less conservative than they used to be. Texas is no longer reliably red, but was classified just last week as competitively purple. And among residents today, uh, not registered voters, mind you, but residents, Republicans enjoy precisely a three-point lead in preference over Democrats. Now think about that. Three points is all that separates them. That was unthinkable when I wrote that book four years ago. <clears throat> so, time is running out. And I don't think that no matter how fast they dance, the far right of the Republican Party cannot dance fast enough at this point to keep up with change. Their jig, I think, is up. But let's step back a second and start with the story of Texas. How many of you uh, grew up in Texas? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you took Texas history in seventh grade? Okay. So you know about your Alamos and your war for independence and all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, there are kind of two views about Texas. Um, one was proffered by a man in San Antonio, a great writer, named T.R. Fehrenbach. Fehrenbach wrote his gargantuan book uh, in the 60s. It was a runaway New York Times bestseller about the history of Texas. And it was truly an epic story, a great piece of um, journalism as history. He was a journalist. He wasn't a professional historian. Um, and a great piece of writing as well. Um, in essence, though, he made this argument, that the story of Texas was really the story of the land. You know, when the first Americans arrived in the early 19th century, uh, Texas was a harsh sparsely populated place about the size of France, where a rough natural law order prevailed and human existence was tenuous and solitary. This led in the mid 20th century to a logical conclusion. The land was what shaped the rugged individualism of Texas and by extension, it led to a naturally conservative philosophical outlook. There was another man. Who here knows who J. Frank Doby was? Okay. There's even a building named for him not far from here. But most people really don't know who he is anymore. Um, he too was a journalist. He too had been a soldier. Um, and he was a folklorist. He was probably the greatest folklorist in the history of Texas. Uh, he relished, too, in the tales of the land, retelling the bygone years of the great ranching era of the late 19th century. But over the course of his years, Doby realized, too, that his Texas was changing. It was industrializing and it was urbanizing. And while nobody loved Texas or romanticized it more than Doby, he reached a very different conclusion than Fehrenbach eventually would. And this is the quote. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Texians is a very old word, which has to do with the original American settlers coming from the south uh, around the time of independence from Mexico and shortly thereafter. And so what he saw was a cycle of history in which new arrivals would come, benefit, and then change the place. And then they in turn would be followed 
by another set of new arrivals who would come, benefit, and change the place. So about 50 years after he died, I was sitting around my house and considering the stories of my time that would be worthy of a book. And I realized that I was right in the middle of the biggest story of my whole life. And that was the change that was sweeping Texas at the time. I think Doby ultimately was right. He had a more dynamic view of history um, than Fehrenbach. Fehrenbach is probably the better writer, frankly, but, but Doby's view was more fluid. Um, the real story of Texas was not the land. It was a story of a people, a people on the move. So let me tell you a story about people on the move. So 15,000 years ago, nobody lived in the Americas. There were no humans. At that time, as evidenced by that map, the first migration to Texas, of which I will recount six, took place from Asia across the land bridge, a place known now as Beringia, where the Bering Sea is. And there, it is increasingly believed by anthropologists that collections of people from Asia settled briefly. And the DNA that resulted from their settling and mixing together would ultimately be the ancestors of the Native American peoples uh, who would flourish later on down the years. But if you follow those little red arrows a little further south, it's clear that these people were on the move. Why? Anyone? Ice. They were trying to get away from the ice, right? So, after about 3,000 years in Beringia, they headed south. They settled in places like the Yucatan Peninsula, Clovis, New Mexico, the Permian Basin of Texas, and a place called Buttermilk Creek near present-day Waco. One reason that Buttermilk Creek is interesting was the abundance of chert. Uh, chert was a stone from which uh, spearheads and early arrowheads could be ca carved. But they had a clever design. If you look at them, you'll see that they're, I'll point this way, they're fluted, right? And the point was that design channeled the blood from a wounded bison, much larger than today's bison, for instance, outward. So the more the bison ran, the more it bled. The last of these people arrived about 7,000 years ago. The ice bridge sank as the climate changed. And these immigrants then settled in warmer places, Texas, New Mexico, Mexico, later becoming the Caduan and the Comanche and others. Frequently, they would share similar languages, but they developed their own cultures. So we can fast forward to the arrival of the first Europeans. We had the journey of Cabeza de Vaca across the Southwest, the expeditions of Coronado, French colonization, which really didn't take hold much outside of Louisiana. In 1591, Juan de Oñate journeyed to New Mexico and set up one of the first permanent Spanish settlements there. The missionaries followed into Texas in the 1700s. It was a fairly light European footprint, though. And unfortunately for the Spaniards, their time was running out. And the reason was, by 1830, after Mexican independence, 30,000 Americans, mostly from the American South, had settled Texas and outnumbered all of the Mexicans and Native Americans combined. As we all know, this led to revolution, an independent republic, statehood, and a subsequent war with Mexico. What most people don't think about, though, is the consequences did not end there. 
Texas was a slave state. It played a very prominent role in tipping uh, the country into the Civil War, upsetting the balance between free and slave states. Here was the unintended consequence of mass migration. On the one hand, the intended consequence was to gain new territory that was accomplished. The unintended consequence was to trigger the country's most devastating conflict. So that story of intended and unintended consequences, all rooted in mass migration, has now played itself out six times in our history. When large amounts of people arrive in Texas, things start to change. The subsequent change isn't always disastrous or bad, but it is always big. After the Civil War and the demise of plantation agriculture, Texas was just another poor southern farm state. But we had a lot of cows, vast herds of wild longhorns that were so numerous that people actually hunted them from horseback because they were pests. So these could be rounded up, driven north along the Chisholm Trail by cowboys and sold to northern markets where the population was growing. The cowboy, of course, became an icon of American culture. But his era was very short-lived. Why? Because the open spaces bred their own demise. After a while, you had such success driving cattle, cowboys weren't going to do the trick. You needed railroads, right? Less noticed, but no less important, was the migration of Mexicans to Texas. That's a subject I won't deal with in great detail here because they don't deal with international migration. It's a very important story, but you all would have to get your sleeping bags out to hear the rest of that. So, we had the railroads. Well, the country was industrializing, and what did it need? Oil. So in 1901, when Spindletop struck oil, Texas changed again, right? But Texas needed to not just be a source for exporting oil to the rest of the country, it needed to industrialize. By World War II, there were 32 military bases in Texas and far more factories that were pumping out everything from jeeps to, well, not jeeps, but vehicles to tanks to aircraft. Um, well, if you were going to do that, and Southerners were flocking to Texas for work, well, they needed some place to live. Well, they couldn't live on the farm, so they had to start living in the cities. We had a vast process of urbanization that began in the 50s and then reached its apex in the 70s. In the 1970s, most Texans lived in cities or nearby suburbs. And they thought they were cowboys. <clears throat> well, what followed that? Well, for most Americans, the Arab oil embargo was a very bad time. We're not there yet. Uh, but for Texas, it was a good time. Price of oil shot up, lured millions of people from the collapsing industrial economies of the Rust Belt to Texas. And so they moved here and became urban cowboys too. But then what followed? The usual overextension, underregulation, financial collapse. The savings and loan bust, which struck in the 1990s with full force. About then, the migration from the Rust Belt pretty much ceased. It stopped. It stopped making sense to keep coming to Texas. Right around then, in the spring of 1992, I was living in Washington, D.C., working as a reporter, and I arrived in Austin to report on the presidential contest of that year. I made the rounds interviewing various people, including a largely unknown consultant named Carl Rove, and took a stroll down Congress Avenue. You would not recognize that Congress Avenue today. Whole skyscrapers, what's called One America, stood completely vacant. 
I could have had it for a nickel had I had the forethought. A third of all the bank failures during the savings and loan crisis were in Texas. And Austin, as unimaginable as this sounds, had the highest office vacancy rate in the United States. Now, this was also an Austin that had a relaxed and amiable uh, aimlessness, for lack of a better word. Richard Linklater produced Slacker during this period. And my favorite quote from one of the characters was, I may live badly, but I don't have to work hard to do it. <clears throat> Glancing at my watch, I remembered a lunch appointment with a pollster. So a few minutes later, I met her at the Austin Club. I had a sandwich, she had soup, uh, no, she had a salad. And we went over the data. Texas was still a democratic state, Ann Richards was still the governor, but things were definitely changing. There was a big shift underway from Democrat to Republican. And a lot of this had to do with the new migrants from Ohio and Indiana. Uh, many were Catholic. Abortion uh, was an issue that mattered a great deal to them. And many were Republicans um, in a state where there were hardly any at the time. Um, as we kept on talking, it turned out that the most conservative Republicans, in fact, were not old line Texans who has, whose families had been here for generations. No, they were the new arrivals, the people from the Midwest. They had come from the, during the boom time and now lived through the lean times. They were mostly middle-aged, mostly white, very Republican. And they were also likelier to like their barbecue with beans. Now, for anybody who grew up in Texas, uh, that's sacrilege, actually. Um, now, Mexican-style barbecue, or chili, I should say, with beans is okay. But chili, normally done. It's just meat, southern style. But it also turned out that these people were out trying to out-Texan us Texans. They were likelier, for instance, to wear cowboy boots in public, like downtown going to work. Uh, she stuck out one foot, and she had a, a woman's pump on. I stuck out my foot. I had a size 10 and a half man's penny loafer on, and so on and so on. And all of it kind of reminded me of a guy that I knew who had recently moved to Texas, and he was working for a Republican congressman. I want to say it was Tom Leffler. And um, he talked with a drawl. He always wore cowboy boots and jeans. He drove a pickup truck. And he always had a can of skull in his hip pocket. And he was from Minnesota. So for a while, it kind of made me mad. But then I sort of got the point. Um, that there was a big change going on. And some of it was entirely unintended. Uh, so, seen through the prism of both thyme and barbecue sauce, um, you could see then that the election of George W. Bush as governor was not some sort of lightning strike of his political skill or Karl Rove's genius. It was the culmination of a series of really large social historical events. He just happened to be there at exactly the right time. So, and since then, and obviously to the present day, no Republican nominee or has ever been able to calculate winning the White House without winning Texas. It is mathematically impossible now. <clears throat> but like all cycles, this one is running its course. So we're getting here to the present day. Now, what, 25, almost 30 years later, right? The demographic and social and political realities of the fifth migration are being precisely reversed by the sixth migration, the people I call the New Texans. We'll skip this, we already know all this. Beginning around 2000, 
and drawn largely by economic forces, not by Rick Perry's genius. Americans from every part of the country have headed to Texas, peaking at about 750 people per day. The number of 1,000 per day was bandied around a lot, but it, didn't, it doesn't pass the scratch and sniff test. Nevertheless, 750 people a day is a lot. So when you add them all up, from 2000 to the present day, that's five million people, okay? Now, if you account for the fact that Texans are also always moving out, Texans tend to move to California or New York, other big states, then the net number is about a million and a half. But we don't know how many of those five million people actually moved out. We just know that the population growth was net 1.5 million. In any event, or either event, it's a huge number. It actually dwarfs all the other migrations to Texas uh, by a large factor. Today, instead of having an economy with just a few pillars, we have about five, if you include technology and services. Um, the economy is different now because Texas has benefited vastly from globalization, particularly from NAFTA. Um, about one in every $10 in circulation in Texas is due to NAFTA. About a million jobs or so are directly due to NAFTA. Um, when people think about moving, they don't think too much really about the politics of the place. That may enter into their consideration. But they really think about, well, can I afford it? Will I be better off? Will my kids be better off? That's the kind of personal calculus that they go through. Uh, in, in the case of Texas, the price of real estate, which is the single biggest expense of individuals and businesses alike, had been sharply and painfully deleveraged, basically, with the SNL bust. The cost of a house in Texas was only a fraction of the cost of a house nationally. I moved back to Texas, I'm from El Paso, uh, in the late 90s, and I got a house with a pool, and two things I liked was not paying income taxes and lots of parking. Uh, that was different for me. Um, to his credit, that's hard for me to say, you know, Rick Perry did have a hand in what he called the Texas miracle. He had an industrial policy. For good or ill or however well the money was spent, he went out and recruited industry to come to Texas. Uh, uh, Erica Greeter, who works at the Houston Chronicle and is also an author of a book on Texas, has argued quite forcefully that it mattered, and I think she's right. Now, I would also argue that spending $439 million on 0.0047% of the workforce is a little bit of overkill, but that's all kind of hindsight and yesterday's news, right? Today, there are three out of four, excuse me, of the 27 million Texans that live here are scattered not over 200 counties, but concentrated in an area that is less than a quarter of the landmass, the Texas Triangle. Composed of Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, the Triangle isn't the future of Texas, it is the present. Soon 80% of the population will live in this little patch of earth. To compare it to some place, if you've been to Southern California recently, you understand how densely populated the triangle will be in 30 years. So, who are these people, these new Texans? Well, first they come from every point on the American map and beyond. Many have been drawn from the more expensive east and west coasts. A lot come from New York and California. That only stands to reason. They're the other biggest states. The other big contributor is Florida, the other biggest state. It's not a question of ideology or politics or 
people being fed up with California's socialism. They're just big states. People move to and from them just like Texas all the time. Many of these people are young, shockingly young, as you're about to see, and they are diverse. Only about a third, as far as I can tell, are non-Hispanic whites. So let's talk about youth. On average, the new Texan is not just overwhelming in his or her numbers, but in their youth. This is important for a, a couple of reasons. But basically, far more than half, as you can see in this chart, um, are under 40. You can tell this is just one snapshot that you're looking at from 2005 to 13. So it's an eight year period. Uh, and it's net, that is to say, we've taken out of it the Texans who've moved away. But you can tell it's mostly young people under 44. So these are people who are either uh, right in the middle of uh, raising their families or have yet to start family formation. Um, where have they come from? Well, if you live in Dallas, people have generally come from Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, and Miami. In Austin, they've come from Orange County, Providence, and a lot of people from Florida. Uh, Houston, a lot of folks from Chicago, Los Angeles, and St. Louis. San Antonio, a lot of Southwesterners from Arizona, New Mexico, and interestingly enough, from the Chicagoland suburbs. As if to underscore their youth, we're talking a lot about millennials. The dark circles in this chart represent the higher concentrations of millennials. And as you can see, Texas is tied with Florida for that. Now, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out there's two things at work. One may be migration to Texas, but the other part that Texas and Florida share in common are large Hispanic populations. When we think about millennials, we tend, a lot of people don't think about people who are not non-Hispanic whites. How many negatives can I get in that sentence? Um, but the fact is that most millennials are exactly that. Hispanic, Asian, African American, and so on. This to me is a kind of interesting number. Two Texas cities, Austin and El Paso, have among the highest share of millennials in the entire country. That kind of speaks to the issue of diversity. Um, and these people, I would offer, are not your father's Republicans, nor frankly are they Greg Abbott's. Abbott did well with the Hispanic vote last time around, but that's because nobody voted. Um, in general, it's a pretty fair assumption that young people in this country are going to tend to be more liberal than conservative. That's not to say there are no conservative young people, but the data on this is pretty clear, not just in the rest of the country, but now in Texas. Um, I was talking to a couple of pollsters, and one of them kind of put the kibosh on getting too far ahead of myself. Um, he said, uh, political attitudes are not a fixed quality. Just because you're young doesn't mean you're going to be liberal. And I said, I understood. But he acknowledged that when you inject a whole new population in, there's going to be an impact. So the Gallup organization does daily polls. And once a year, since 2008, they've reported on the annual results of these surveys. And there are two important trends. On the right, yeah, the right, the circle. Texas has tended to be, when this started out in 2008, among the most conservative states in the union. 
25% more conservative than the national average. That has now dropped a full 15 points, okay? So at most, Texas is around 10% uh, more conservative than the national average. The left hand uh, bar shows you how people identify which party they like the most. Now remember, these are not registered voters, so it's not who's going to vote. These are residents. And the balance that's not on there are independents, people who say they're independents. That would get you to 100. But that number was published just this month in February. And it kind of blew my mind uh, because the assumption has been all along that there are more conservatives in Texas and than liberals. That still holds up. But there are barely more Republicans than Democrats. Um, one thing that's not on a chart here, which I think is most alarming for Republicans, we kind of get, get at it in this one, is what I think is kind of a demographic death knell for the Republican Party. Um, and that is that it has not only stopped growing but it appears to be shrinking. Uh, the, in, in the latest presidential contest, about 4.5 million Republicans voted, but hardly any more. That number is pretty, pretty fixed. It actually peaked in 2004. That was 14 years ago. It was Bush's uh, re-election campaign. So that number has been stuck there even as the state's population has exploded. Remember, the state's population has grown 50% since 1990. Um, this is a snapshot of just the voting, the, uh, voting since 2012. So that'd be through 2016, I think. And what you're seeing is obviously a net increase for Republican votes of only 100,000 votes. But for others, a net increase of 877,000 votes. Uh, that's an alarming figure. That is, a, that is a party that is not replacing itself, essentially, as people get old, move away, whatever the question is in their lives. Um, you all have probably heard the, well, before I get into that, the same number is, is applicable to gubernatorial races. So it's stuck at around 2.7 million people. So for Democrats, their challenge is really not that big. They're just way, way, way behind, right? When you talk about 15 million or so registered or uh, voting, age, voting age population of about 16 million people, these are not big numbers to overcome, particularly when your opponent is standing perfectly still. Um, you all have probably heard the recent news. Three times as many Democrats voted the first day of voter registration in Harris County as they did in the last election. In the 15 most populous counties, remember there's 220 counties in the state, but they, most of them don't have any people in it. That's kind of rude, but 15 have all the people. In all 15 of the most populous counties, Democrats outstripped Republicans for the first week of early voting. We saw a million people registered to vote for the first time in the last cycle, and a million more just so far. And it's only February. Um, I could go on with more. Anecdotes, one that strikes me and is close to home here in Austin is that uh, Lamar Smith, who denies that science exists, has held the 21st Congressional District for since the Pleistocene era. My ex-wife used to work for him. Um, and uh, the Cook Political Report, which is a very influential little publication 
published by a renowned pollster in DC, has downgraded his district from um, safely Republican to just leans Republican at this point. And it's one of the most gerrymandered districts in the country. Um, so, uh, what does all this mean? Well, <clears throat> I don't think that Democrats should go home and start counting their majorities just yet. Uh, in the end, politics is about tactics. You know, when push comes to shove between primary day and election day, it is about turnout and money and advertising and consultants and blunders and capitalizing on other people's blunders and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I'm not rooting for Texas to turn blue. I'm not a professional Democrat. I'm a professional journalist. I just want to see a good fight. Um, I am rooting for a competitive two-party system. Um, One-party monopolies become brittle and corrupt and obsessed with nothing but their own power, and they stop solving problems. Um, and I want to get into some of that here. Um, I'd like to actually thank uh, Ryan, who's not here with us tonight, who inspired this chart. I redid it with the help of Michael Hoag, obviously. But this is not just conjecture. These are not what ifs and could be's. And the reason is the change that I'm talking about has already happened. It's not coming in the future. It already took place. If you look at the blue line, which is domestic migration, people moving from the other states, it has fallen off. People have stopped moving to Texas. Not entirely, and they never will. There's a natural churn, right? But it's far below the historic figures that we saw. Now, there's probably a real simple reason for it, and it's called money. Texas is not cheap anymore. Real estate has become on par in terms of it, its expense with the rest of the country. No big savings. We also have lower wages than other states, and nobody in their right mind moves someplace to make less money and pay more for a house. Um, that's just not part of the calculation. Um, so the things that I've talked about in terms of who are these new Texans and what are their attitudes and what are they going to do, it's already happening. It's not going to happen in 2020 or, or 2024. It's underway now. Now, it will manifest itself over time. People always ask me, well, when? Well, I don't know. Um, Matthew Dowd, who used to work for George Bush, uh, had the best guess of anybody, I think. He said, some time between 2016, no, 2014, he said, and 2020. That seems about right. Uh, Jim Henson, who is a pollster at the University of Texas, and I talked the other day, and he said that he thinks the Democrats are going to have a pretty fair year this year. Well, what does that mean? Well, he thinks they'll win some races. Well, that's start. I guess, right? Um, but you have to have experience winning races, a few small ones, to start winning the big ones. You can't just win the big one overnight. That, that doesn't happen. Um, so I think he's right. And there may be more in the wind than that. Um, uh, Beto O'Rourke is a popular candidate, but the most important part of that US Senate race to me is how really unpopular Ted Cruz is. His unfavorable ratings are through the roof. Uh, I don't know that our work can overcome the power of the incumbency, but that's a real anchor around um, Cruz's candidacy. That said, the next big thing is already underway, and that's the arrival of the people I call the next Texans, and those are the people in purple. Those are people who have come from other parts of the world. 
Now, often people think, well, they, they, they came from Mexico. No, they didn't come from Mexico. Mexican net migration to the United States is zero or negative. Um, yes, there's a small amount of unauthorized immigration that takes place, about one-tenth the level of what it was in 2000. Um, but we have lots of people who are coming uh, legally from Latin America, but also from Africa and from Asia. Uh, China, in particular, um, is a great source of immigrants to the United States. And if you go to Houston, you'll see that Houston has become an international city. It publishes its official documents in eight different languages. There are about 100 dialects and about as many consulates that are there. So these people will take a while to sort of get into the system and to either become citizens or begin flexing their political muscle. But it took a while for the people coming from other states to do that too. They didn't just show up in 2014 and hand the keys to the governor's mansion to Wendy Davis. That's not the way it works. People have to get their feet under them. Now, part of them getting their feet under them, and mercifully, if there is a God, I'm near the end, so don't worry. Um, politics is more than a parlor game. It's about real things. Uh, the problem with professional political watchers and players is they treat it like a game, and it isn't. Um, it's, its impacts are felt on where you live, how you live, how you make a living, and what future there is for your kids, should you have any, or your favorite pet. So, Rick Perry used to talk a big game about Texas number one, and we were recession proof and all that kind of stuff. Excuse me, that, that, that aside, um, Greg Abbott, by comparison, has shown absolutely no interest in economics at all. I don't know it's because he's a lawyer or he would rather just not talk about it. Because in the last year, for the first time in years, Texas tumbled out of the top two most desirable states for business in CNBC's annual survey of executives nationwide. Number one. That low tax, no regulation state, Washington state. Hmm. Governing Magazine ranked Texas 21st. In 2013, it was the third, plus, third best place to do business. Wallet Hub had Texas in 20th place. And even though we don't have a state income tax, we have sales taxes and property taxes. Wallet Hub ranks our effective tax burden at about 30th. That's on par with Massachusetts. Recently, the governor remarked that when he asked Amazon why two Texas cities made the finalist list for their second headquarters, their reply was the readiness of the workforce. <clears throat> he seemed to beam like he was personally responsible. Well, I hope he doesn't dislocate his shoulder patting himself on the back. But the reality is that readiness is at risk. The public schools, which are the engine of upward mobility, are under assault, not repair. The public university systems, in which I have taught, are bursting at the seams, having to fund their own growth, because the legislature won't. Opportunities are also not particularly equal for taxpayer-funded and even land-grant universities. Today, Hispanic kids graduate from high school in Texas at about the same rate as the Anglo or African-American kids, but they don't go to college at the same rate. Just 20% of students at UT up the road are Hispanic, even though Hispanics are about half the population. This is not a question of diversity for the sake of diversity. Um, you mention these things in a right-wing Republican will say, well, that's just political correctness. No. The very economy of Texas hangs in the balance. A college degree can mean the difference in a person's income by as much as 100% over their working life. We are risking, as a result, creating a new majority of second-class citizens 
with minimal education and minimal earning power. Unable to sustain a booming consumer economy and unable to maintain a tax base. And Steve Murdoch, who was the Republican appointee to the Census Bureau and the state's demographer, once said Texas could easily slide into the jaws of, quote, mass poverty unless we solve this problem. So think about that, mass poverty. I doubt that Amazon is going to be looking to relocate in the midst of mass poverty. Um, but I doubt that business will want to stay or relocate to places where political leaders have given serious consideration and are doing something about things like climate change, globalization, and immigration. The stakes could not be higher. Uh, the right wing loves to talk about how we're number one. Texas is number one, America is number one. Okay, well, if the Texas economy falters, the United States becomes number two in size of economy in the world versus China. China will become number one. So, I told you we were near the end. I have a confession to make. I wasn't born in Texas. I arrived here at the age of two from New Mexico, of which I promised to have no memory. Still means I got here much faster than Dan Patrick. Um, and to paraphrase David Crockett, never Davey, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as quick as I could. Um, conservatives in Texas have kind of seized the mantle on our symbols. You know, longhorns and cowboys and guns and pickup trucks and all that kind of stuff. Um, the fact is, it takes all kinds of Texans to make this place go around. Sure, a cowboy from the big country or a roughneck from the Permian Basin, but it takes suburbanites from Plano a Hispanic family from Houston, and so on. We are not a caricature that they often seem to think that we are. And we are not a monochromatic people. We're not frozen in time. We're a place where, as history shows, change lives. So pretty soon, on a bright spring day, I swear there's going to be one, a drive across the hill country will reveal the Landscape that we all have come to love. Blue bonnets and Indian paintbrushes and Prairie Sabina. It's all reminiscent of something else that David Crockett wrote home in the 1830s. I must say, as to what I have seen of Texas, he wrote, it is the garden spot of the world, the best land and the best prospects for health I ever saw. And I do believe it is a fortune to any man to settle here. There is a world of country to settle. The new Texans, those who have just moved here, are part of the latest and perhaps greatest migration. As such, their travel is not just a historical fact, but an intimately personal one. Migration is risky and transformative at the same time. It's quite true whether you're an Arctic tern or a monarch butterfly or something in between. I'm a Texan who came home. My daughters are child transplants who now assume being Texan as part of their story. Each is leaving the state this year. But both apparently are conspiring to have the outline of Texas tattooed on their ankles. As their father, I cannot approve. As a Texan, I'm very proud. Everything changes in our political system is not exempt from the laws of history. If we think we are and stubbornly refuse to adapt, then we will simply fall behind. We will be a poor southern state once more, battling with the likes of Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas, as we already now do in some state rankings. But if we adapt, then Texas in the 21st century will be what New York was in the 19th or California in the 20th economic engine of the nation, social laboratory, political bellwether, maker of presidents, cultural trendsetter, 
exporter of innovation, a global center for commerce, capital, and labor alike. A world nearly unto itself. There will be touchstones along the way. The newest Texans will adapt to in their own way. They will uncover the wry humor in how Texans poke fun at themselves and everyone else at the same time. Everyone will buy a pair of cowboy boots and all will eventually ponder the big existential question. Why can't the cowboys win the big one? But everyone changes Texas with their presence, at least as much as it changes them. If we acknowledge this as a historical reality, then we have nothing to fear. We will not lose our history because we understand it better. It's spring, after all, in Texas, and that means rodeo time, and that will never change. By embracing this history, we will keep Texas the grand adventure in the American story, because Texas is much more than just another place on the map, or a cowboy hat, or a pair of boots, or some politician in a borrowed pickup truck on TV claiming to be he's something authentic that he's not. Texas is an experience that soon one in every 10 Americans will know by a different name, home. Thank you. With that, I'm happy to take questions or comments. That we'll now be accepting uh, questions for Richard. Uh, when I, uh, please raise your hand and you can ask one question and then I'll go on to the next person. Does anybody have any questions of Richard? There we go. Thank you so much, Ms. Richard. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. And I appreciate everything you say about people come from Africa, too. My daughter, father, from Trinidad and Tobago, he served this country. He went to Iraq, Afghanistan, and, you know, Kosovo. And I'm proud of him. And I left my country, Togo, West Africa, with my ex-husband. I came here to New York City, May 7, 1997. And I saw, uh, first, I don't even know where I'm going. We left. Uh, it's very sad. I left my mom behind. She's very sick. And I don't want to leave him. He told me, you're married, you got to go. Oh. Because I'm a political woman, too. So. But I'm on my way. It's hard. So, to Togo, to Ghana, to Mali, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to Burkina Faso, I to work hard, baby. Um, Mali, my son was tall. Yeah, they put me on the TV. And the lady told my son, um, from the mosque, his brother living there. So I find my son, and he told me, I need to press judge against the lady. I said, no. She do not hurt my son, so I cannot do that. I'm sorry. So I left. So Mali to Senegal. So we had state people came in. They interviewed me, and my ex-husband said, OK. Be in Canada, graduate in France and all that. Be in Italy. Togo was going to have a German and French. So I said, OK, let's drive to the United States of America. On the way, a lot of stuff happened. I was very abused by him. But it's OK, you know, because my kids I'm keep going. As I am here today, and I'm proud to hear everything you say. You know, it's hard. You have a dream, but I keep praying for the walk and see. And I keep going because for my kids, mm -hmm. 
And nothing can stop me when I'm keep praying. Well, everybody can see. And what happened in Los Angeles and in Florida, it should not happen. But it's okay. So nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And uh, I you have a song I want to sing for you. Mm hmm. In French, if you don't mind. Allez-vous-en sur la place et sur le pavé. Allez-vous-en sur la place. Il cherche mes amis. Tous les enfants de lumière vous, qui vivent dans la nuit. Tous les enfants de mon père. Séparé de lui, allez-vous-en sur la place et soyez mes témoins chaque jour. En quittant cette terre, je vous ai laissé un message de de lumière qu'en avez-vous en fait quand je vois aujourd'hui mes enfants s'éloigner crier douloureux d'avoir pleuré allez-vous sur la place, vous, 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 et sur le pavis, allez-vous-en sur la place, il cherche mes amis. Tous les enfants de lumière vous, 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 qui vivent dans la nuit. Tous les enfants de mon père séparés de lui. Allez-vous-en sur la place et soyez mes témoins chaque jour. Chaque jour. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Does anybody have a question about the presentation to Richard? Thank you. Can you expand a little bit kind of on how you see this change unfolding? Um, we kind of, I'm trying to weave together some of these themes. We've got, as you mentioned, uh, sort of the, these gerrymandered districts that have a massive impact on elections. We're coming up on a census where we won't be likely, even if there are some uh, seats that get flipped, that probably that balance of power wouldn't be a sub substantial enough to really undo some of that radical gerrymandering. Lay that against what you're talking about in terms of uh, sort of the defunding or the inadequate funding for our institutions and sort of that, that social change that results from that, along with the fact that the Texas government is, we have these massive looming budget shortfalls in 19 and 21 that the current, it, uh, the folks aren't really interested in solving. So I'm trying to, I really appreciate all the things that you're laying out, but how do you actually see this potentially unfolding in say the next five years? Um, well, I, I think that, I mean, you've asked all the right questions. I mean, um, there is only one solution and uh, there's a change of uh, political representation and leadership, and that's kind of it. Um, I get classified as a liberal columnist. I kind of chafe at that a little bit, because um, I guess I'm more liberal than a social conservative, but I used to be a Pentagon reporter and I had a bumper sticker in my cubicle that said Americans love to bomb Iraq anytime for any reason. So uh, my politics are not quite as that clear cut. That said, um, the, uh, the only solution is to, uh, is a wholesale change in government, that's it. There are no incremental solutions um, because if you have the same political leadership 
that draws, say, congressional districts after the next census is a good point. You're going to get similar results. They're just going to wind up in court again. But these guys aren't afraid of going to court. Everything they do winds up in court. That is not an issue. In fact, th there are some issues they know are never going to succeed and are going to be killed in court, but they're going to do it anyway because it buys time. Um, so there is no other solution. And frankly, given that there is not a single important social headwind blowing in the Republicans' favor right now, there is, it is, it would be unforgivable for the Democratic Party in Texas not to put on a far better showing. Just unforgivable. Now, I understand the advantages of the incumbency, given, okay? Uh, but you've got everything working against the Republican Party at this point, except for one thing, they're in office. Um, now, are there fundraising advantages to that? Sure. Is that the mother's milk of politics? You bet. But there's a giant fissure that's opened up even when it comes to fundraising. The far right is not raising their money from business anymore. They're raising them from super far right social conservatives who are legislating their religious agenda. Um, so uh, there, there's nothing that is, that is really working the Republicans' way right now, nothing, other than the fact that they won the last cycle. Uh, so that's a simplistic answer to a complicated question. But I think without a wholesale change, it won't matter. Well, I tend to believe that people are pretty good problem solvers. So I tend to believe that the answer is probably yes. Um, if you look at other conservative, and I he hesitate to use the word conservative when I'm talking about the far right, because they're not conservatives. Um, but when you look at what Kansas attempted to do, right, with their fiscal policy, it, and budgetary policy, it was a disaster. And it turned around on a dime because of it. You know, I think Donald Trump can fool 37.9% of the people 100% of the time. That's a fact. But the rest of us are pretty much caught on here. And uh, I find anecdotally plenty of Republicans who are pretty freaked out by um, the likes of the leadership of their own party. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't do the Democrats' work for them. They have to get it together. And uh, they can ride the anti-Trump tailwind this year. It's enough. It'll work. Um, but they're going to have to get it together with candidates and messages for the coming cycle. Uh, they've already blown one office, in my opinion, and that's the governor's office. They try to get Jillian Castro to run. And he didn't because he wants to be president. Well, that to me, this is a personal opinion, automatically disqualifies him from being president because the fight was here, it was this year, and it was now. Um, but that's, that's a self-inflicted wound. And I don't think that the party has taken enough public heat for that. Uh, to leave Greg Abbott, who has accomplished virtually nothing as governor, uh, practically uncontested, is ridiculous. So, I don't know. I mean, if everybody's going to put their eggs in the Democratic basket, you may be right. We're in a lot of trouble. You know, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Oh. Oh, over there. Sorry. I'll get, don't forget. We won't, we won't forget you. No. Okay. I was just curious, um, like how, how much of a factor is the gerrymandering in slowing us down from becoming a purple state? 
Oh, that and voter suppression, like the voter ID law. I think the voter ID law is probably a bigger factor, statistically speaking. Um, Abbott, when he was attorney general, tried to defend the voter ID law, but in his evidence submitted to the court, acknowledged that there were 800,000 people who were effectively disenfranchised from voting. Well, that's almost a million people, right? And they were predominantly African Americans and Hispanics and elderly and college students, the majority of which are not going to vote Republican. Um, so, um, in terms of the gerrymandering, I am not enough of a mathematician to speak particularly intelligently um, to that, but it, it's a, it, I'll put it this way there are no states that I know of in which a city as large as Austin has no home congressman. None. Um, so you're disenfranchising a million people, basically. That's a big number. Yeah. Sir. Um, assuming that uh, the state legislature and the governor and statewide races remain in Republican hands and uh, the big cities remain in Democrats' hands, do you foresee any less antagonistic relationship between those cities, the big cities, Dallas, Austin, Houston? No, it will only grow. The cities are all, where all the economic action is. And uh, if you take those sort of 15 most populous counties, well, they're all basically wrapped around the four or five biggest cities, right? Um, and so, no, I mean, there's, I think, been a misreading. There's this idea that the state has absolute power over the cities because it has primacy under the state constitution. And the, the state created the counties, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Matt, but the cities were granted, well, under certain conditions, which was most, cities were granted home rule, which was that they could do their own thing as long as it didn't violate state law. Um, I, I, I'm not a lawyer and no city has asked my legal opinion, and maybe I'm wrong. But it seems to me that uh, home rule has to mean something. It can't just be willy-nilly tossed aside. But that would require some city or cities to sue the state government. Um, they're going to keep coming after the cities. And it's because they're motivated by electoral politics. Um, the Texas Triangle, I tried to do a map, and I haven't been able to finish it. If you looked at a map of Texas, you know, on election night, and it shows like it's almost all red, right? The 220 counties. And then there's like 15 little counties that are like blue. Of course, what it doesn't tell you is that's where all the people live, right? So if you actually did a map based on population, it would look very different. Um, I've seen some maps, they're hard to sort of read, which is why I didn't reproduce one, but. Um, well over half the state's blue. If you look at, if you took a, a population representation on a physical map, um, that's a huge and immediate threat. Um, so yeah, I think they'll keep coming after them. I really do. Anyone else? We have time for one more question. Matt, do you have any? Thank you all very much. Well, this concludes our Imagine Austin Speaker Series. Thank you very much, Richard. Let's give, I'll give a big round of applause Thank for you. Richard.
jacket up, bring home the score. Who can ride me on that lawn and stay tight in the saddle? Never loses nerve. 